half in the bag. Get out of here. I think he's still breathing. It's hard to tell. Either way, the biohazard suits that we ordered should get here in a couple days. Then we could finally go back and get some Plinket blood. Money, money, money. Remember, because we're going to sell the antibodies to Joe Biden. Is that what's happening? Yeah. Oh. Because Plinket has the Omega variant, the most dangerous coronavirus variant of them all. Oh. And if he survives, then his blood will create precious, precious antibodies to fight off this new dangerous variant of which Mr. Plinkett is the only person to have it. But in the future, it's gonna spread around. And if we have those antibodies, cha-ching, money in the bank. Oh, so we're following through on this whole storyline, huh? Look, Mike, I know we're wearing these masks so we don't catch COVID. Hey, keep your mask on, you idiot. I was the one who was in close contact with Mr. Plinkett, not you, remember? Come here, you prick! Oh, you get in the f***ing wheelchair! I'm not getting in no f***ing wheelchair! Oh, oh, oh! So, shouldn't you be the one wearing the mask? No, it's to protect you from me in case I caught the Omega variant. Idiot. But Mike, people wear masks to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. No, you wear the mask so you don't get it. Plus, there's currently a mask mandate in our state, county, or local. Well, if there's a mask mandate, then shouldn't you be wearing a mask? It's a voluntary mandate. That's right, a voluntary mandate. Oh, would you look at this? A judge in our state, county, or local just put a stay on a lawsuit that was pending challenging the mask mandate. What? Oh, wait, no. Sorry, I read it wrong. What? There was a stay on a temporary order to lift a ban on the voluntary mask mandate. What? Oh, wait, they just updated the news. Oh. The stay on the ban of the voluntary mask mandate has been challenged what? by lifting an order to overturn a ruling that a ban on a voluntary mask mandate is unconstitutional. What? Wait. Now a judge has overturned a block on a stay of the challenge of the ban of the voluntary mask mandate. What? Well, that's good bad news. What the fuck does that mean? It means you have to wear a mask, but I don't. This is bullshit. This makes about as much sense as people still giving money to Neil Blomkamp to make movies. Your mother Angela, she's our patient. What? I've been out of touch with her for a very long time. What? Hey, do you remember that game, The Sims? What if your mom was possessed by a demon that looked like a giant bird, and the only way you could contact her was through virtual reality game of The Sims? That's what this movie's about. It's called Demonic. So we're talking about Demonic, uh, the new film by Neil Blomkamp, uh, who made, famously made, uh, District 9. Mm -hmm. Well, a really good movie. Yeah. Followed by uh, Elysium and or Chappie. I forget which order. Uh, Elysium, then Chappie, then an extended break, and now Demonic. He's back, baby. Right. I, I did not see Elysium. I did. It wasn't great. And then Chappie was worse. I felt like I got what I needed to get from the trailer of Elysium. Yeah. It's like the, like a sci-fi thing about like the haves and the have-nots, yes. and then I'm like, okay, I get the the social commentary. That's that's one of his traits up until this movie is the heavy-handed social commentary, even District Nine. But that's there's so much weird shit in that movie that it, it doesn't like overshadow it. No. Um, but then Chappie was just like a confusing mess of like, what are you trying to say? Something about AI, something about police, something about g gangs. I don't know. Something about short circuit. Something about Short Circuit meets RoboCop. And then you get to this movie, which is... <laughs> Lots of weird ideas. That's what Neil Blomkamp is. It doesn't always come together in a cohesive movie, but he always has these weird ideas. Or had. 
then you get to this movie and that's the first thing is I never, ever, ever, ever want to see another demon possession movie for the rest of my fucking life. Well, this is not really a demon possession movie. Uh, I mean, it is, but it's like a like a really weird take on it, um, which, you know, I guess is admirable, an attempt, right? It's admirable in the attempt because it's not like, we got to go to this house and this lady is possessed and they got her strapped to the bed and like a traditional Catholic priest comes and, you know. Yeah. Um, do you remember we watched a movie? Uh, something, there, uh, like, there was like a cop in it. Uh, was it like Eric Bana or something? Oh, yeah, that was the uh, Scott Derrickson movie. Uh, the Devil something. Devil is the movie he did right before he did uh, Doctor Strange. Yeah, the devil, the, the 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 devil something something. You're the devil's son. I got nothing against Neil Blomkamp. I, no, and that's, I, I did not like this movie at all. But the one thing I'll say is, uh, it's getting terrible reviews. It's like something like fifteen yeah, percent on Rotten Tomato. Right, right, right. But I, I kind of admired because he's kind of like an M Night Shyamalan, where he comes out of the gate with a movie that is well received, does really well, and then everything else is like a high concept idea that doesn't quite work and no one likes it. It was like movie after movie. And then the, like, I don't know, I, I, I don't even know if he can get a big budget movie made anymore. So the idea that he's just like, fuck it, I'm just gonna make, I think this movie is like less than $2 million to make. I'm just gonna make this low budget thing. And there's something kind of admirable about that. Like, fuck it, I'm just gonna make something. Yeah, I, I caught a couple uh, little bits. He, uh, he guess he did the circuit, the press, quote unquote, press junket circuit, which oh, now is it's all done over Zoom. Which is now done on Zoom uh, with with pathetic YouTube channels. Hi, Neil. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? Good. Oh man, um, it is an honor to talk to you, sir. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I apologize for the weird background. I had to pull over on a road trip home to talk to you. <laughs> Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, he's there and he's got his chair and, and the background is part of the demonic poster. It's like the graphic was too big. You can't tell what it's supposed to be. Yeah, but every, I, the, every interview I clicked on, it had that. Yeah. The same, the same thing. And so he's like jumping around. I think he must have done them all in, in an afternoon and, and he was being interviewed and I didn't want to watch them all. I saw lots of them mm -hmm. and I'll probably show clips here. I'm assuming it's just like a normal press junket where you get asked the same questions and give sure. the same stock answers. I, I clicked on a couple and I started them up and it's like, first of all, love the movie. And now I'm just like, oh God, no, I'm having nerd crew flashbacks. <laughs> Neil, amazing job on this film. Me and my girlfriend watched it and we're terrified uh, to say the least. Uh, but I, I remember, I just saw uh, one thing he said and uh, he shot this during COVID. It, it basically, the summary is because of COVID, I wanted to do something that we could just put together ourselves and make because everything else seemed to be paused. Um, so he was like, I wanted to make a movie, but there was a lot of restrictions obviously from COVID. So I, I, I could only do this, this, and this. And then that was like, oh, okay, I can't watch anymore because that's gonna be stuck in the back of my head the whole time I watched this. Sure. And so, yeah, obviously a limited budget, uh, limited actors, effects uh very lots of handicaps mm -hmm. and put in place when making this movie um but why this subject matter and why this script well that's where it felt to me like well i want to make a movie and like i said that's admirable but at the same time i never got a sense from watching the movie that uh neil blomkamp has any affection for horror i mean cosmic horror is definitely something that in I don't know where it is in my previous work, but I'm very interested in it. And and body horror is another thing that I'm definitely interested in. It doesn't feel, it's not a good horror movie. It's never scary at any moment. And it rarely feels like it's even trying to be. It's just like horror is, uh, we're, we're, we can at least make our money back because horror always makes money. It kind of has that like cynical feel. It's like the, the filmmaking equivalent of that scene in What Hot American Summer when Janine Garofalo tells Paul Rudd to pick his plates up. And he's just like, Ugh. like that's how this movie felt. Like, uh, demon possession. Uh, our friend comes over at three in the morning and turns into a demon and does this contortionist shit. I'm not gonna make it scary, but I know we gotta shoot it. 
So many things in life can be compared to that scene from <laughs> Wet Hot American Summer. <laughs> the last year and a half of most people's lives, I guess, can be. Yeah. Uh, that, that might be the best scene in cinematic history. I think it is. It, it's just like... <laughs> That's just uh, so you, all you have to do is say it's like uh, uh, it's like Darmok, you know, Paul Rudd in cafeteria. <laughs> right. Oh, I understand you. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. But that but that's how it felt to me. Like, like, oh, we'll make a horror movie because we can make our money back. I never got a sense that there was any sort of affection for not just horror, but the story. Like, it seems like, because, you know, Blomkamp, he likes weird sci-fi ideas, and there's a little bit of that in this. And then there's, I, I don't know if we'll get into spoilers, I don't know if it matters, no one's seen this movie. Um, but there's one reveal, about two-thirds of the way through, that was so fucking weird, and I was like, oh, if this goes in a crazy direction, I'll be on board. Which is, uh, so, not Rumi, not Numi Rapace is what I call the lead actress, because she looks like... Uh, Numi Rapace from Prometheus, but it's not her. Uh, she goes to this medical research facility. That's where her mom is being kept. They got her on a little diving cap thing, and AKA she's plugged the, into the local community college. Uh, sure, yeah, wherever they could shoot, where there weren't a lot of people around. Um, but it, it, it's revealed at a certain point that that organization is actually a front for the Catholic Church, and these are rogue, militarized Catholic exorcist priests with giant guns <laughs> and i got so excited for five seconds but then the next time you see them they've all just been killed off screen the only interesting aspect of the movie and it's so underdeveloped that i i'm assuming that's a budget related thing budget and or covid because yeah you have a big action sequence with guns going off and things flying around and explosions and stunts and people being pulled back on wires and that's when you need crew yeah. to come in yeah. and in in a little army of crew members to come in and work the rigs and blow things up and pyrotechnics and yeah all that to, uh, you, you, you just put put some uh, fake blood on a guy and tell him to lay down on the ground you need one guy and some fake blood. Yeah. Right, Jay? But that's one of those concepts where if you're going to introduce that and not follow through on it, then don't even bother. What a, what a disappointment. Neil, I love Demonic, and, and let me tell you. The only interesting aspect of the film. By interesting, you mean bad. Yes. Okay. Entertainingly bad, though. I was like, this is fucking crazy. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Number one right out of the gate, location. Neil Blomkamp is originally from South Africa, and Johannesburg, South Africa, I think. Uh, and he's also Canadian, and so this was shot in Vancouver. So I'm watching it, right? And I'm like, where is this, right? All these, these mountains, uh, I mean, is this like South Africa? Is this filmed in South Africa? It looks beautiful, right? And then I see like a police car. I'm, the whole time I'm trying to figure out where it's from. I I'm was like, trying to look at license plates. I was like, where is this? They don't, they don't have the, the European-ish, those longer license plates. They have the North American license plates. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, where is it? You could have changed them out, of course, to make it look like maybe it's supposed to be California. I don't know. And I'm like, where is this? So I'm distracted by that. <laughs> and then I see something on the cop car and it's some name that starts with an O. I saw that and I was like, what is that? Yes. I kept getting distracted by, I mean, this is, these are things that a normal person probably won't even be paying no, attention no, to. No, but. No. but, and then I Googled it and it, it's, it's a region near um, Vancouver that's known for it's like wine. Mm. Uh, and it's like, come enjoy a six night wine tour of this beautiful region in Vancouver. And they're, they're drinking wine in the film. Oh yeah. And then I'm like, a beautiful paradise it's known for its delectable wines is the greatest place to set a horror picture. <laughs> and I'm like, I, then it's, then it's, that's where the COVID comes in. I'm like, he's stuck there. Yeah. He's stuck in beautiful Vancouver in the summer of 2020, <laughs> trying to film a movie about a spooky exorcism. <laughs> I mean, that shit needs to be done in October in Massachusetts where the leaves are falling and we hear tubular bells. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't need to see people sit, sipping wine with beautiful 
sunsets. I was o- also really mountains. distracted, and this is again related to the budget, but the first time she meets up with her, I guess it's her old boyfriend, yeah. and they're sitting outside at some bar or restaurant or whatever, and it was so fucking windy the day they shot it. There, every shot, her hair is blowing like crazy. And uh, that's one of those things where it's like, well, that's what they got that day, so that's what they had to work with. How are you doing? How are you, how are you holding up and stuff? Yeah, right. There's live mics. It was an 80 yard. It's very windy. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to mention the patio scene because, yeah, her, her, is her boyfriend, her boyfriend's name's Martin. Her name's Carly, and her friend's name's Sam. Yes. I know this because I looked up on IMDb, and that's all their, like, real names. Uh, yeah, I so know I Carly like, yeah. Pope is the lead actress. Yeah. It's not yeah. Numi Rapace, everybody. It's not. Although Numi Rapace was in an alien. She's in Prometheus, yeah. And Neil Blomkamp was supposed to make Alien 5, bringing back Sigourney Weaver. Michael uh, Bean. Michael Bean. And then Ridley Scott said no. Actually, what happened is after that, then he started making, like, short films. Under under something about oats. Oats, so Quaker it's the company. Oats, something, his company. <laughs> he's making Quaker Oats commercials. Yeah, he's making short films for the internet under some banner called Oats. Yeah, and that's, again, that idea of, like, fuck it. Like, yeah. I did these big movies. They didn't go over well. I'm just going to keep making stuff on my own. Admirable. He Admirable. wants to create things. Yeah. He's trying. We're just judging the final results, <laughs> which isn't good. Did he write? He wrote, wrote Chappie, wrote Elysium. He wrote this, yeah. Okay, see, I think, like, when you, when you have limitations and his limitations are he wants to tell a spooky demonic story and he's got this main character and a relationship with her mother mm-hmm. and there there are no singular strong elements in the whole film no if the characters and all their relationships are really strong and well done and well written that could hold this up his his crutch is he needs to rely on space machine guns and monsters and big budget effects in order to to carry the movie to the finish line. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the I guess the, the heart of the story it's, is supposed like to be... It's like us as filmmakers, but with everything. <laughs> you know? But yeah, uh, the relationship between Carly and her mom is kind of supposed to be the heart of the movie, but we don't get any scenes with the mom outside of the virtual reality. We don't. We get a couple mentions of their relationship, but it's not very strong. It was maybe think of that movie Relic that we talked about from last year, with the the girl that goes to take care of her mom with oh, Alzheimer's. That was where great. it's like, yeah, well that's like again super low budget, lots of limitations, but that relationship is so strong. That it, that it completely carries the whole movie. Yeah, fucking creepy ass visuals. And, and yeah, like really good visuals. And this movie doesn't have that. No creepy visuals, no strong character stuff. It's like they got a DP that shot Lifetime Network movies. You know what I mean? <laughs> it had that look to it. Yeah, all the daytime stuff is just very flat. Uh, I noticed some of the nighttime stuff. It's very grainy. Not like it wasn't shot in film, so it has that like digital video grain where they were shooting in low light, which again goes to the limitations. So that's that would be fine if it wasn't distracting, but I was distracted by the low light as opposed to, ooh, this is dark and creepy. But also with the limitations, all the virtual reality stuff, I had a feeling while watching the movie, and I was they confirmed it after the fact, that this was probably like real, because it's not slick enough to be like, ooh, virtual reality, like we're showcasing these special effects, but where they're actually like filming you know, when you see like a motion capture and you see like the low res version of it live while you're while you're filming it, it was that. Um, so I, it's like, oh, we have this technology, we'll film it this way. Mm. And that's why it has that kind of low res glitchy quality yeah, yeah, to it. Because yeah. that's how it was actually recorded. It's like, that's fair enough. Better than making it look like, I don't know, I was thinking of like the Lawnmower Man or something where it's just like <laughs> overdone bad CG effects. I know the Lawnmower Man's a dated reference, but... That was really bad. Yeah, I also got vibes from a a different film that we watched. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. I didn't quite enjoy it as much as you, but in hindsight, it's a work of art compared to this, uh, where the lady puts on a helmet and goes inside other people's bodies to commit murders. Oh, uh, Possessor. Possessor. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's how you do it. <laughs> and, and, in terms well, that's a, that's a movie where maybe not the strongest story, but the visuals and the way the story is told is what carries it. And the acting. And the acting, yeah. The acting in this, not great. Uh, let's just talk about what happens. You got a lady uh, who lives in a city uh, whose profession is unknown. We don't know anything about her. We don't know anything about her. <laughs> her, her friend Sam moves back from somewhere. So what else is going on? I mean, catch me up. What have I missed? <clears throat> Into a nice cabin -y house and they have some wine. And her friend Sam was the one, and I think Martin too, the three main characters were the three ones when they were teenagers, went to the sanatorium mm -hmm. to find her mother. Yeah. Uh, so our lead character, Carly, her mother worked for a hospital as some kind of administrator or somebody important who said, hey, there's an old abandoned sanatorium. And if you don't know what a sanatorium is, they're, uh, uh, they're in lots of ghost hunting programs because they're all notoriously haunted. But every single one of them is haunted. A sanatorium is where you send people who have TB, tuberculosis, a highly contagious disease where you cough yourself to death. You can't cure it. So they put them all in this building. Most times the buildings are shaped with a curve and they put them and they build them remotely, obviously away from other people, and, uh, and they build them to where the wind pattern goes that way. So that the, the people in the sanatorium get a constant uh, a flow of fresh air mm. so that they can cough their lungs out and it goes one way and comes out the other side of the building. I didn't know any of this. Yeah, and so they're notoriously haunted because Bodies pile up. Sure. People die all the time, and they some, some of them have body shoots. Oh, God. Where it's like so many bodies, it takes too long to bring them from here to the morgue. Let's make a shoot where we could shoot them across the bottom of the building. And so the mom says, I want to uh, 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 renovate this sanatorium for some fucking reason. No one would ever do that. And so while the, gir the girl and her friend and the other friend are having some, some booze, the mom says, I'm going to the sanatorium by myself at night to check it out. And she gets possessed by a demon. Because we learn the sanatorium was built on sacred, some sacred burial ground or something. Evil land. That, Evil land. That day, that land day, that was sacred. Yes, her friend Martin. In our exposition dump. Yes, who is also some, for some reason, an expert. Mm -hmm on demonicness. Well, he wasn't an expert, but he looked things up on the internet. And so now- No, he, he had a secret, he had a secret bunker. Oh, that's right. He had all the shit on the- Yeah, yeah and he's been drawing some... the picture of the evil chicken for <laughs> years, <laughs> right? He's been doing lots of research on it. He's, yeah. our, he's our exposition dump yes. man. That scene was where I was like, oh man, we're really in trouble. It's starting to go downhill. It's so, it just like one, cliche after another like the most worn out cliches yeah built on the ancient land i was like oh god it's a, it's a it's a double a double whammy because sanatoriums are just haunted in general that's all that's enough like she got possessed by a demon because yeah. the place was haunted they say there was so much death and disease there that it opened a portal to hell sure and they just say well it's also also built on some kind of evil land that dates back to the 1500s where there's just been death and destruction there. And the guy has pictures on, on Reddit uh, that show that that's true mm. because he looked it up yeah. on the internet. And he tells her all about it. And he's like, I drew a picture from my dreams of the chicken demon. <laughs> and here it is. <laughs> And it looks like a professional artist drew it, even though I'm some guy who lays concrete, <laughs> right? You're a really fucking good artist. <laughs> I drive a truck and I fucking, I'm a mason. I, 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 uh, you should go into art because this picture of a demon is really good. Anyways, uh, so he tells her that and after the mom gets scratched on her forearm, she's then possessed by a demon, mm -hmm. a demon who is an arsonist and loves to burn things. And so the mom then sets the old folks home on fire. Uh, Gets sent to jail. Yes. And then to top it all, uh, she goes and kills five more people. They also uncovered that she'd poisoned people at uh, a local church.
killed another five. That's, that, that's five. It's like, oh, there's the sanatorium, and then there's the old folks home, and then she kills people there, but then she kills other people. And it's like, this is way too convoluted. Yeah, and then she gets Streamline arrested. Streamline all of this. Arrested and then uh, threw out her demonic possession uh, convulsions. She becomes a cutter and then gives herself such a traumatic head injury that she ends up in a coma for 20 years. Yeah. There, and then the demon is unable to escape. Mm -hmm. Now, we're continuing on with the plot. Okay. Then, Catholic exorcists disguised as doctors working in a local community college have developed this amazing, amazing technology mm -hmm. to, uh, to go inside somebody's head their brain waves are still working, even though you're in a coma. You can go inside someone else's head somehow via the magic of computers. It's, it's a super advanced technology. To talk to a possessed person. Through their, their like subconscious. Yes. Yeah. And they give her no instructions on this. And she agrees to do it like immediately. I was surprised by that. You think it's, like, you'd have to try and convince her, like, this is pretty fucking weird. But she's like, ah, I'll do it. And then she just goes in there to, to swear at her elderly mother. You know what? Fuck you! What, what was also was interesting was her friend slash ex, yeah, Martin. Remember he texts her and he's like, hey, what's up? It's me, Martin. And then she tells her friend Sam, she's like, Martin texts me. She's like, woo, girl, have some more wine. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, meet me at the patio for coffee? Question mark. And she's like, okay, LOL. Then they meet at the windiest cafe of all time. They meet at the windiest cafe of all time. And then he says, oh, I'm here to tell you that I was recruited into a study where your mother is in a coma and they tried to put a brain scan device on my head <laughs> so I could go inside her head and talk to her in her co coma state. Yeah. And the, the daughter didn't even know she was in a coma. Carly, she's in a coma. I mean, she's like fully paralyzed. A coma? What happened? And he's like, I think they're gonna come try to contact you because your mom might be possessed by the devil. <laughs> so in his text, he just, meet me for coffee? <laughs> uh, how about, I need to talk to you. It's really fucking important. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she's like, she's in a coma? I'll show up. You wanna put a thing on my head? Okay. And fuck with my brain? <laughs> sure, how about my mom's a sick fuck, I'm out of here. Yeah. And then. Yeah, they should have to try and convince her just immediately. Let's get to the the Catholic uh, SWAT team exorcists. Rogue and militarized Catholic exorcist priests. What is their ultimate plan? To kill demons, motherfucker. To kill demons, motherfucker. And how do they accomplish that? How is connecting the daughter to the mother's brain in any way going to help accomplish that. Well, I think, isn't there something about how they discover that, am I completely making this up, that they're the, the demon's ultimate goal is to possess the daughter? Like that's his final goal? Isn't there something about that? I watched this movie like a day and a half ago and it's already left my I brain. I think that comes up later where he says he's, he's coming after you next. So, so I got the impression that it was, yeah, they need her because that's, the demon's ultimate end goal is to get into her. But shouldn't you want to keep her away from her then? I, I don't know. Uh, because, and what do guns have to do with anything? <laughs> They're badass. And so part of the plot then revolves around the mother is, I think they were trying to get Carly and the mother back to the sanatorium as the ultimate like conclusion of the plot because they think that that's how the demon can move then. If the demon has to be back in its original place of possession. Okay. Which is all news to me. <laughs> uh, and hey, every movie has its own mythology. If that's the mythology in this movie, that's fine. Um, and the demon uh, has to, has to uh, maybe while it's in the middle of flying into Carly's body, that's when they shoot a, a non-corporeal entity with machine guns. Maybe there's some sort of supernatural guns. I don't know. We only saw them for five they, seconds, and then everyone like gets killed off camera. So. Holy bullets. They've been blessed by priests. Sure, sure. Uh, but then they pull out the most ridiculous thing in the world. So the only thing, the only time I laughed out loud in the film. Oh, oh, I know what you're getting at. The Holy Lance. Which? <laughs> the Holy Lance. 
hasn't been in the Vatican for 1,000 years. Which we lead up to is uh, Carly shows up at the place, and this is when you're like, oh, everybody's dead. Except for the one guy who's not quite dead yet. He guess he's alive just enough to give information. That old chestnut, that old cliche. Tired as hell. Um, but yeah, he gives her the special, uh, special supernatural dagger. Well, a thousand years it's been in the Vatican's possession. It's the Holy Lance. It's the magic thing that will kill a demon. Yeah. Uh, See, this is in movies. This is your setup and payoff. We didn't set anything up, so we'll set something up right before we have to use it. Uh, here, use this to get to the end of the movie. And if they got that Holy Lance, then why so many machine guns? <laughs> and if their ultimate goal is to kill the demon, how about you just stab old granny who's in a coma with the Holy Lance when nobody's looking? Yeah, yeah, you got the body. It's not going anywhere. Because remember, at the very end, spoilers, Carly becomes temporarily possessed by Fire Demon Man, and she stabs herself with the Holy Lance, which causes the demon to come out of the body. That's he, it. He's got nobody else to possess, so he goes, yeah. yeah. Maybe if they stabbed grandma with the Holy Lance, in the hospital or the research laboratory, whatever you want to call it, then the demon comes out, then it would just kind of like possess the nearest like nurse or... Well, that's kind of what it does with possessing the bald dude. Yeah, okay, so... It's... Again, something else that happens completely off camera. Oh, hey, Carly, by the way, your mom's not possessed anymore and uh, the head of our research facility is. Right, uh, yeah. That's the biggest tragedy of this movie and it's not even presented as a tragedy. That mom's life. That sucks. She just got possessed and then was in a hospital and in a coma for 20 years and then just fucking dies off camera? That's horrible. Hey. If it was presented in the movie as a tragedy, that'd be one thing, but they're like, oh, we gotta move on to killing the chicken monster with the magic lance. Things were tough in Canada during COVID. I guess. No vaccines, demoni demonic possessions. <laughs> and Neil is on. Jodie Foster. Oh, yeah. At the end, she puts on the night vision goggles to hunt down the bad oh, guy. Oh, yeah. And I thought, Jodie Foster did that in The Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. Jodie Foster was in Elysium. Oh, that's right. That's something. It's something. <laughs> uh, I wasn't really as into paranormal horror that much um i mean i like the exorcist and i love the shining um and this is where i got really confused right because she has that nightmare where her friend sam comes over lets herself in at three and well first she lets herself in hey babe oh what the fuck what the fuck sam jesus you could have killed me you just let yourself in and then she's like, okay, I'll leave. Um, and then at 3 a.m. she's like yeah. pounding on the door and it's and then she comes over and she's let me show you something. It's 3 a.m. I just came by to check on you. Yeah, this is like, definitely not a fake out jump scare scene. It's not a dream. Yeah. And then she gets weird and she's like, she puts on a, an old timey. The, uh, what it yeah, was called. Yeah. yeah, those are actual medical masks. Oh, you sure. Know, they're, yeah. they're, they were used in the old timey tuberculosis days. Mm -hmm. And I guess the idea is that that's kind of what the demon looks like, too. Mm, so it's a connection chicken, there. But big chicken. The giant chicken. Uh, and then she's like, ah, and does the body contortion, and then she wakes up. And then they cut to a computer monitor, and bad guy, bald bad guy, and all of his... That's when we introduced the Black Ops uh, Vatican exorcist soldiers. Yeah. And they're watching... They have a camera feed in her bedroom. Oh, yeah. And then I thought for a second, I'm like, is she still in the simulation? Mm. Is, the, is the cruddy, like, like uh, a previs kind of like, um, you know, whatever that junky... The virtual reality. Virtual reality yeah. kind of like look. Was that like, 
What's that like a front? Mm. And then the actual like uh, VR experience looks identical to reality. Ah. And I'm like, oh, she's. St and I thought they were gonna cut to the hospital and do a, like a pullback and show both women lying in the beds. That would have been a twist. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. And then I, I guess not. They just set up creepy security cameras in her house. Because they're keeping an eye on her because she's going to get possessed, I guess, or whatever. Yeah, they, they uh, I mean, that's fine. <laughs> they could have set that up, you know. Somebody was in my house, police. Yeah. My door was left open. You have a creepy scene where she sees someone in the bushes. Maybe that's a demon or something. Right. And then it turns out it's just the scientist guys. I guess what should have been an indication early on that they weren't actually like scientists, medical people, and they're actually undercover rogue exorcist priests is uh, Carly gets this gigantic fucking cut on her arm and it's pretty fucking deep and they just wrap it in bandages. Then we cut to her like making breakfast and there's just this gigantic open wound on her arm as she's cooking breakfast. It's like, that's pretty gnarly. It seems like they should have done a little more medical attention to that thing. Some stitches it's, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's a bleed out kind of <laughs> like. A, it's really deep. It's, uh, that's that's, that's uh, down the street, not not across the tracks. So yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that was a proper suicide cut there. <laughs> and uh, they seem to just blow it off. Yeah. Well, it's because they're not really doctors. Well, I, I had my suspicions when the technician guy was just tatted up all over his arms. But then I thought, I'm being judgy. It's 2021. Mm -hmm. A fully tatted individual can indeed go into the medical field. I, I won't be judgmental, but something about that. Clearly the other guy with the beard, the bald guy, mm -hmm. just by his body language and the way he acted, he's, she's like, what do you do here? And he's like, yeah, I'm not. I'm a physician. I'm like, oh no, you're not. You're a you're a devil worshiper. Uh, that would have been an interesting twist. If they were a devil worshiper. It was the exact opposite of what the actual twist is. The exact is. opposite of the twist. They're trying to bring out the devil mm. from mm. from being in a co trapped in a com comatic uh, body. That would make more sense if they're like manipulating somebody like that. Where, yeah. where the the process of hooking the daughter up to talk to her comatic mother. And then that, that transferred the demon through the electrical wires into Carly's brain. Yeah. And well, yeah, they can't, the demon's stuck in this coma victim, so he can't get the demon out, so we gotta get her daughter back to, that makes the whole movie make so much more sense. Yeah. And she, <laughs> she, she like sits up in the bed and, and then the, they, the technicians walk in and they take off their lab coats and they have like black suits on with like a pentagram. Yeah. And they, Our Lord and Master has arrived and she goes, she's like the dark phoenix. And, she, <laughs> and only her friend Martin and Sam can save the day. Sam's the girl. Sam's the girl. She gets burnt up in the truck at the end yeah. and Carly gets over that immediately. Sorry, Sam. Sorry, Sam, bye. Uh, she tried to get it, that's funny. Like she, they laid her in the back of the truck and then at some point the demon set the truck on fire, but she was like halfway out of the truck. <laughs> Oh, we should have left the doors unlocked. <laughs> Schwoops. They had to kill her off because there could be no one alive to become possessed by the chicken. I guess. Uh, so a little clunky, uh, not, not very well acted, not very well written uh, in terms of characters. The characters were flat, no backstory. Very, very, very... Uh, unconnected to the audience backstory, the mother-daughter yeah. relationship. We didn't really get much from that. Could have spent a little more time on that. A little less time walking around, looking in the dark. Drinking wine in the valley. Drinking wine. So yeah, uh, I, I kind of found this movie dull. Um, like I said, it exposes Neil Blomkamp's weakness, which is uh, a kind of a maturely written story this kind of felt like a like a junky red box movie cliche yeah that's the other thing too is like his movies usually are at least distinct visually and this looks like it's directed with like no interest in making the movie that you're making everything's so flat he 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 operates well with more money more access to visual effects better actors he probably benefited more, from a different writer too yeah. Kind of like, that's how I always felt about Rob Zombie's movies too, where it's like, he's got some interesting ideas visually and casting wise, but he should not write his scripts, but he writes all of his scripts. 
and they're all terrible. Yeah, I gave it a chance. I was curious because of the extremely low scores from from a, a fairly well established director. You see low scores like that on like junk. Oh, sure. And you're like, okay, yeah, I'm not watching that. But then it's like, okay, well, what what is this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, what did this guy make? I'm curious. I'd be curious to look at the the rotten tomato scores for his movies and see if they just keep going down with each movie. If that's the case, bring a bring a chart up right now. Okay. Because I think that might be the case. District 9, very well liked. Elysium, not liked as much. Chappie, no. And then this is like 15%. Anyways, uh, so yeah, uh, I would recommend to skip. There really isn't much to learn from this. No. Or m much to gather from it or any entertainment value whatsoever. If it went overboard into schlock with the old like rogue priest angle with them with their guns and stuff like that's what i thought it was going to go like then it would at least have some sort of entertainment value from just how ridiculous it is but like i said they're killed off screen immediately which was disappointing so yeah that's that that's that I'm going to switch off the news websites and go back to our live secret camera feed of Mr. Plinkett in his house. Okay. Beep, beep. Oh, there he is oh. on the screen. Oh, looks like he's coming too. Oh. Oh. Hello? C can somebody take me to the hospital? I need to be put on a ventilator. <coughs> Hello? Oh, I just got an alert. Our hazmat suits have arrived. Fuck yeah. Get your needles and vials all ready, because it's time to go take some samples of Mr. Plinkett's blood. To be concluded next time when we do a movie review with a wacky wraparound skit. Hello. What? Hello. Mike and Fast VCR. Hello. 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 What was that? Hello. 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 Coronavirus. Hello. COVID. Hello. What? What? Hello. Who was that? Are you a ghost? Show yourself, spirit. Show yourself. Um, uh, I, I compel you in the name of Jesus Christ to <laughs> take me to a ventilator. <laughs>